Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. We welcome all of you who are maybe visiting with us as well, uh, and including those, of course, who are listening in on the radio or perhaps through uh, YouTube or our website or on public access TV. We all come together in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to worship our God. Just a few brief announcements that I have. Uh, today, immediately following the service, we're going to be having a potluck luncheon in there, and everybody's welcome. This, you don't have to be a member or, you know, even you could be visiting your first time. You're certainly welcome to come in for that potluck. Uh, and right about the time where you're starting to finish, I will give you a little notice that we'll be starting soon. And then we ask you, you can, you can either come and take one of the chairs to be able to see the, 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 the screen, the TV there, uh, or you can stay at your tables, but just be aware to see the screen well. And Jay, Dr., uh, Reverend Dr. Jay Johnson will be with us pretty soon. He's up at Jacksonport. He will uh, lead us in, in uh, just a, an explanation, a, a kind of brief summary of what it is that we accomplished in this uh, CAT survey, which I have to tell you was quite a bit. We learned a great deal. We have an enormous amount of information. So I want to thank every one of you who took that time to fill that out online or on paper. It was of great help to us and has given us a wonderful look uh, at where we are right now as a church and where people would like to see us go. And we're going to be, we've heard you and you will hear back a lot about that over these next few months. So that's immediately following the service. A reminder, we're starting confirmation class this year. It will not convene though until the uh, first weekend after Jacksonport ceases its services. That's the day or the last one for them is the second Sunday in October. So the third Sunday in October, we will begin that process. And so more information will come out on that, but those of you who have been at the family meeting are, are aware of that already. Uh, and then just a, a one last thing, and then I'm gonna have Angel come up, she has one. Uh, the, the Marshall House, which is the other side of the property here, that building uh, that many of you know and been driving by for years, that is part of this church. And it had its purpose for many, many years was for use with youth, and it, and it served that, that purpose very well. But in our time, we don't have the youth that we once had, and it had fallen into disuse for several years. Well, our recent uh, involvement with Hispanic Ministries in Dark County gives us a new reason, a new purpose for that building. So the Hispanic Ministries, which began, uh, it start, began its start as a new faith start of the United Methodist Church Wisconsin Annual Conference here in Door County, and our church is hosting that uh, that new faith start. And we're hosting it by providing facilities. And so it was determined that the facility that would make the best sense is the Marshall House. So what we did is, uh, I should say others went out there and cleaned it up, and I'm so grateful for that. And we got most of the stuff out of there, but we saw right away that the carpet has to be replaced. It is in really bad shape. It was determined to our trustees and our leadership board that what made the most sense was to put down commercial grade vinyl planking. You've seen that, it's in many buildings now. It's easier to care for, it stays cleaner, and it gives you a lot more um, opportunity to do different things, move things around and so forth. And so we're gonna be doing that. But in the process of doing that, uh, our head trustee and the trustees felt that a repainting made sense. The color that's out there is kind of dark, uh, it's beautiful, it, it was in its time and it served its purpose, but it, thought, it was thought for a new faith start, we should also have a new painting. And so uh, our head trustee has purchased all the paint. Now what he's asking for, if there were people willing to help paint. Uh, we need to get it done probably uh, by uh, within another couple of weeks if we could, that would be best. We've had one volunteer who said they'll come forward and do some painting, but we need more. So if you're willing to paint, the paint's out there, the materials are there, you don't have to worry about the rug, <laughs> the carpet. Uh, so if you spill a little paint, don't worry. Uh, and if you're willing to do that, please contact the office or Jerry Co-Bishop, our head trustee, or let me know, and I'll put you in contact with Jerry, and we'll schedule that. So maybe you say, I could do the ba one of the bathrooms, there's two, or maybe I could paint the hallway walls, there's one hallway, or maybe I could do one wall in the, the main room, uh, you know, or maybe more please let us know and we'll, we'll provide you the materials, the paint's already here. And, and uh, so just let me know or let Jerry know as soon as that can happen and we'll help you get uh, anything else you need. And, and it can be left open, you can come at your, your uh, schedule and not necessarily have to follow any kind of um, 
time when somebody's in the office. All right, well, Angel has an announcement for us, so I invite her to do so. A couple weeks ago, Amanda reached out to me and said, I have exciting news to share with you. She got a letter on her birthday from the World Vision people, from our sponsor child, Lania and Zambia. They are graduating from the program. We have provided enough support that their community is able to self-sustain now. They don't need us anymore. <laughs> so a couple of things that they sent us, we, we started sponsoring her in 2019. And now in this year, she'll be uh, graduating from that program. Uh, we've played a crucial role in helping Lania, her community, and other vulnerable children to build a brighter future. Together, we've equipped local leaders and families to make a lasting change in areas like child protection, access to clean water, health care, and more. Now their community can continue to grow and flourish on their own and carry on the good work we began together. So we will be saying our goodbyes to Lania but it's happy to hear that their community has been able to become self-sustaining and not need the help anymore that they had gotten. So, some exciting news. So I don't know if you remember when that uh, came, there was a Sunday that Angel and Amanda sat back there and were challenging us to, to, to also sponsor, and several of us did. So the church sponsors, Two? We have three, we have three now. Yeah, we're down to two. And at that time, but others in the church are sponsoring as well. So they, they let us in that, and it's, it's kind of neat to see that that, uh, that comes to fruition in that life. And I expect the others are probably not far behind. All right, uh, as we turn now to our time of worship, I invite you to join with the call to worship. Now, call to worship serves a purpose. It is to center our minds, bring us together around the purpose of why we're here. We're here to worship. And, and Saturday, yesterday, those of you who were in the leadership board uh, meeting and with the, the cat, uh, with Jay, saw a video of, uh, about what it means, the difference between the, the that, what we do, and the why. The that is what we're here to do. This is what we do, we worship. This tells us about why. Would you please follow with us both print? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise the Lord in the heights. Let us praise the name of the Lord, whose name alone is exalted, And now if you'll join with me in our hymns of praise, there are two. Uh, that one's in the black book, but the words will be up here as well. The other in the red hymnal, and the words too will be up front.
Thank you, and please be seated. And we invite any young folks to come up and join Angel up front. How are you today? Good. Good? It's really warm out today, isn't it? Yeah. So this week, this past week, we had our vacation Bible school, and one of the first stories we did was about fishing. So I'm going to read that story again today. One day, Jesus went down to the shore of Lake Galilee. A crowd had gathered to hear him tell them about God. Jesus got into the boat of a fisherman named Peter and taught the people standing on the shore. When he finished speaking, Jesus said to Peter, You and James, John and I are all going fishing. It is useless, Peter answered. We fished all night and caught nothing. But if, I, if you say so, we'll go. The fishermen caught so many fish that their nets broke. Fish filled the boats and the weight almost sank them. The fishermen couldn't believe their eyes. Peter was frightened. The other fishermen were too. Jesus said, do not be afraid. From now on, instead of bringing fish into your boats, you will help me bring people to God's kingdom. The fishermen pulled their boats out of the water and left them on the shore. They left their family and their friends. They left everything to follow Jesus. They became Jesus' first disciples. So what we talked about was Jesus changes everything. Because if you follow him, he will change everything anything in your life. Okay? Have a good day. <laughs> join me in singing I'm going to live so God can use me. Words will also be up front.
morning. This morning's scripture, it, scripture is Jude 17 through 23. Warnings and exhortations. But you, beloved, must remember the words previously spoken by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. For they said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers indulging their own ungodly lusts. It, it, it is these worldly people devoid of the spirit who are causing divisions. But you, beloved, build yourselves up on your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Look forward to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on some who are wavering. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. And have mercy on still others with fear, hating even the tunic defiled by their bodies.
Thank you. What a beautiful, beautiful choir song. That's just one of the most, one of my favorites. So thank you so much. Well, back at the beginning of this month, I started a series in a book of the Bible, seldom turned to, uh, especially for the purpose of writing sermons, the book of Jude. And on that first Sunday, I explained to you why that was, that I had become very interested in the nature of the early church. What was it like in those first few years, decades, after the Lord's life and, and his resurrection? And, and Jude gives us insight into that. Now, I, in the first Sunday, I told you who, who is Jude. Well, Jude is a form of the name Judas or Judah, and that he indicates who he is in his introduction. He says, he says Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ, brother of James. And I explained to you that James, who was at that time the, the leader of the church in Jerusalem, literally the first overseer, if you will, of the Christian church, because that is the original church, Christian church was in Jerusalem. And there was a council that had grown into, come into being, and Jude was the head of that council. And so important was that council that when a controversy came into the Christian church a, a little later on as it was growing, and, and a few years later, that it could even call back Peter and Paul and others that are very notable. That was how important the church in Jerusalem was. And Jude identifies himself as the brother of James. And as the scriptures tell us, James was the brother of Jesus Christ. So what we found, as we look through the scriptures in Matthew, Jesus had several brothers and sisters. And we know this because of the fact that it is told in the gospel story. They're mentioned on several times. And James was so well known that all Jude had to do is refer to him, to identify him, his self, for who he was. And so that's who Jude is. It was written somewhere around the early 60 AD period of time. This would have been the time about when Mark and maybe Matthew were putting together their gospels, some 30 odd years after the time of Jesus' life. Now Jude, like his other brothers and sisters, we presume his family, did not recognize Jesus initially as being the Messiah. Indeed, the scriptures tell us they thought he had lost his mind that he had somehow gotten off track and they had come to take him back, to bring him home. And we have that incredible story when they're standing outside this packed house uh, and, and they say, you know, we are the mother and the brothers and family of Jesus and we've come to, to get him. And when that word was passed by person because it was too packed to get in, Jesus looked at his people around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers and my sisters, all who love the Lord are my brothers, my mother, and my sisters. So that's Jude. He came to faith after the resurrection, like Jesus' family, uh, his brothers and sisters, uh, we're told, did. We found out that he and his family had traveled around uh, and were sharing the gospel, somewhat like an evangelist in their day, and was sharing the faith. And you may recall that he said, this is all about the faith. What I've come to tell you, what this letter is all about, is all about the faith. Indeed, he had set aside something he had desperately wanted to do. He mentions it right in the opening uh, lines of his letter. He said, I had wanted to write to you about the salvation of us all. That means about the faith. And I, I told you, I, I believe that meant that he wanted to write his own gospel, which if he had written it, would have been the earliest of the gospels written. Sadly, we don't know that he did. If it, he did, it was lost. But the reason he turned his attention from this work that he had so desired to do was because of a difficult thing that had developed in the church. Early on, this is before there's any sense of religious practice to speak of. This was at a time when people still were Jewish in their basic faith who have adopted Jesus as the Messiah. That belief had become their own. They would go to, 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 to the synagogue during the Jewish Sabbath, which is sunset Friday to sunset Saturday. They would practice the various celebrations and feasts of the people that they had grown up with all their lives, what they knew. And then on Sunday mornings, the first day of the week, we're told they would gather together. They would, they would sing psalms. They would read scripture. They would celebrate the resurrection of the Lord. 
They would share a meal and food, and then they would take what was left because there was an abundance of that, and we get what are the first deacons. These people would take this food and share it with the marginalized. That is what this early church looked like. But it was having a problem, and Jude was desperately, desperately trying to reach out to warn them about it. So we found out that that problem, as he described it, was that there were people who had come into the congregation. He called them intruders, interlopers. And, and, and as I, I said that first Sunday, it, nobody welcomes an intruder, hence the meaning of the word. These were people that are unwelcomed. However, they had done so. They had done so under cover of, of, of disguise. He describes it as kind of like they, they conceal who they truly are, sort of like the idea of, of, of wolves in sheep clothing, that kind of idea that we see in, in, spoken of in other places. And they had come into it, and what are they doing? They are taking people away from the faith by claiming additional revelation. They, he called them dreamers. He said, they, they come to you and they say, this is what it means to be free from sin through forgiveness. This is what it means to not be bound by the law of Moses in the same way we are in the past. And what they thought it meant was the freedom to do whatever it is you chose because you could be forgiven for that. This is a controversy taken up by Peter and Paul and others because it grows. And, he, and, and they were turning it in, in, into some of the most, uh, what, what, what in their day, they, the word used is debauchery which doesn't mean anything good then and it didn't mean it doesn't mean anything good now but it meant was is that they were turning people away from what had been the understanding of their faith both from the Jewish tradition and the teaching of Jesus and he was terribly concerned that they were going to mislead them into into what he saw is the consequences of that and he called upon the old testament for examples now we call it the old testament there was no New Testaments, no writings at all. Maybe a letter, we don't know that. The, the dating is, gets confusing there. But there was no gospel. There was, their scripture was the Old Testament. That is what they were steeped in. These were Hebrews. So their morality was the morality of the day. And he said, they are taking you away from that into what leads to death. And he was desperately concerned that they know that. Not because he was judgmental, or he was stubborn, it's because he loved them. He loved them, and he wanted them to know the truth as he understood it. So he said, what you have received is the faith, that which was given by Jesus. That's all they knew, the teachings of Jesus, as it had been given to the disciples, and at that point, he's meaning the original 12 minus Judas, who had been replaced at that point, what they are teaching, what they are showing you, that is the faith. And that's what you must hold on to. And ever since that date, since that timing, I should say, ever since that time, humanity has been adding on to that, that faith, developing things, rituals, teachings, doctrine, as we call them. It just means official teachings. We've been building up, building up, building up, building up so much that it is difficult sometimes for us to go back and discover that pearl of great price, that treasure that's worth giving up all that you own to possess, the faith, which is Jesus Christ's own words. The teachings of Jesus is what Jude was trying to protect. So we went through that. We, understood, we came to see where he found in the Old Testament, as we call it again, those places, examples where others had done things similar, who had done this for their own gain or their own purposes, and, and were condemned for it. And so we saw where, uh, where Jude found that to express how he felt about these people. Now today we turn to that part where he speaks to them the faithful, the beloved, who he indicated in the very beginning this letter was for. And he says to them, you who are faithful must remember what the apostles taught and warned you about, that the time would come when such people would come into the world that would try to take you from that faith. Now remember, I'm not talking about religion here. I'm talking about the faith of Jesus Christ. Religion grows out of faith. Religion are the things that we do. 
going back to Jay's little video the other day, and those who were there saw that, but it was trying to express the difference between the that, religion is the that, the faith is the why. Those things we do, but the more important and basis is the why. And he's saying the why. They warned you that they would try to take you from understanding the why and literally confuse you with the that, if that makes sense to you. And so he goes on to say, do not let that happen to you. Stay faithful to the faith. Stay faithful to the faith. Hold on to that pearl of great price, that treasure. Hold it close and build upon it your own personal life, your own way of living, your own way of understanding. Do so from the basis of what Jesus Christ taught you. So what did Jesus teach? You know, people have made the faith so complicated that some people think, well, you know, I need experts to tell me that. People study all. No, you do not. Jesus' words are for all of us. Jesus' words are for whoever will read them, who will do as Augustine, the great church father, as they call him, did when he was given a sense of calling. If you know anything about Augustine, he has a tremendous impact on our understanding of the faith today as we practice it in religion. Augustine was not what you would call a very well-behaved man. Read his story. And one day he was sitting in a, in a yard by a church and he was asking God, you know, he, he wanted to know what to do. He was so confused with his life. And the words came to him from God, pick up and read. What do you suppose he understood that he should pick up and read? The words of Jesus Christ. He picked up, he read, it changed his life, and he influenced uh, generations to this very day. He still in, uh, affects how we believe. So the word is not that complicated. And, and Jesus, you know, they constantly tried to get him, you know, well, you know, let's talk law. You know, what does God command, right? You know, because most often I have found when people want to know what God's law is, it's because they want to apply it to somebody else, right? Seldom do we pick up the law and say, well, how does this reflect my life? No, we generally want to use it for the purposes of judging others. I'm sorry. That's the history. We are people. We are, have human nature. That's what we do. And many religious faiths do exactly the same thing. They're concerned about what is right in accordance to their understanding of Scripture. They're concerned about what is right practice. In other words, they're so concerned about the what that they lose sight of the why. He says you must not lose sight of the why. So he goes on to talk about that. He says, stay close to that faith of Jesus Christ, which teaches you that you're to love God with all that you are and that you love your neighbor as you love yourself. Let's replace that word with care because care in my sense of understanding this meaning of love, which is an expression outward, means that all of us are responsible to care for each other as we would be cared for ourselves. No one is exempt from that. Everyone is called to care. We don't get to put that on somebody else. We don't get to say, well, that's your responsibility. It's up to us to do it as best as we are able to care and love others as we would be cared for and loved ourselves. That is Jesus' message. And it isn't me summarizing it. That's how he summarized it. He said, believe in the Father, believe also in me. And they went on to tell us, God has a plan for you that goes beyond this life into eternity. And he knows you, knows you, knows me, to our most basic being, and loves us. Loves us in the same way we are called to love. That is the kernel of faith. That is that golden jewel or that diamond or that pearl of great price or that treasure buried in the field that one once understanding how important it is would give up all the rest to possess that is what jude is speaking to us about 
And then he goes on to say something here that a lot of people miss because they think Jude is so judgmental that they never get that far because who's he to tell us how to live kind of thing, which, you know, is pretty common today. But you know what he goes on to call for? Mercy. Did you hear those words? Be merciful. Be merciful to those who do not understand that, that faith. Be merciful to those who seemingly are struggling with that faith. This is a call not to be judgmental, but to be willing to bear with others as they walk faith in this life of faith as we do. No matter how holy you might think you are, you're not holy enough. No matter how good you think you are, you're not good enough. None of us are. No one ever has been. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't have been necessary, would he? If we could have done it on our own, then we would not have needed Christ. But God saw our need, the scriptures saw, uh, tell us, and saw to that need in the person of Jesus Christ. And it was Jesus who said, as I speak to you, the words I speak to you are the words the Father have given me to say. So what is the Father saying to us through the Son and through the Holy Spirit? Love one another. Care for one another. Treat each other as you would want to be treated and to love God with all that you are. And Jude is calling us to unity around that faith. And he points this out. Those who divide, those who seek to divide us, do so not from purposes of what is good and intentional, uh, in a sense of intentionally trying to live in accordance with the faith. They do so from their own selfish purposes. Indeed, he calls us to look to the dividers in our lives, those who are trying to divide us from the faith and by extension from each other who seek to live within the faith. There is the place you should look for trouble. There are the ones that are causing the issues in your life that pull you apart. Do not let that happen. And how do you not do that? He tells us in this, Instructions for the Faithful is the title here, Hold Fast to the Faith. Be merciful to others. Be willing to allow others to be in a different place than you are. We are in no position to judge anybody. We are in no position to look at another person and because they look different, worship different, uh, have different traditions, different cultures, and to say to that one, you have no place with me. We are in no place to make those judgments. And Jude is calling us to look instead for the heart, the faith, and he's saying, share that faith. That's what he means by snatching people from the fire, from the destruction, because he was, remember, looking at the consequences he saw in the Old Testament and the examples he had. Show mercy. Snatch all that you can from that, that way of destruction and live in peace with one another and in unity around the faith. That's what Jude teaches us. That's what this little letter is all about, and it's been ignored and looked over by so many because it sounds like Jude is saying that you just can't do the sin you want to do and get away scot-free. He's calling people to account to the faith, the faith that saves us. It isn't all the stuff that churches have invented in 2,000 years that save you. It isn't the things that we do, it's why we do them. If what we do is, is just to be doing it, it is empty and has no benefit whatsoever. It is why we do it that saves us. And Jesus said, that is your faith. That is your faith in the faith that I have given you. That's what saves us. So I love the traditions of the church. I love the ritual. Jesus has commanded us for three sacraments, baptism, sa uh, the sacrament of communion, and foot washing, something we don't do much, but he commanded that too, by the way. Did it on the last night. He was with his disciples. And some traditions practice that as a ritual, as a sacrament. Those are the sacraments Jesus taught us. Those are the things he said we must do. And why do we do it again? What is the that? That's the that, but what is the why? because you love God and because you love each other even as you love yourself. 
That's the faith. It's not so hard. It's not so complicated. And Jesus offers it to us as a gift without price to us, but an unimaginable price to himself. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Next week, by the way, we're going to turn to a part of Jude that you didn't know, I bet you. You may not have ever read it. You never maybe heard a sermon before I started doing this crazy thing before. But I guarantee you, uh, if you look, you'll find out the last blessing Jude gives, you have been blessed with. If you've been sitting in a church, United Methodist or others over the years, you've had Jude's blessing uh, offered for you many times. Wait till you see the words. Maybe you'll remember them. I'll show you where they're in the book of worship if you don't. Thank you. We're going to sing now together, if you would please, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. And I always think about this beautiful rendition of Jesus when I think of the shepherd, the lambs lifting their heads, stretching to reach his, his touch. May we sing this together. As a reminder, we receive prayer requests in that basket in the back. There's some cards you can fill out if you choose to, or you can contact a church office at any time, text, telephone, and share uh, if you have a prayer request. And please indicate if it is okay for us to share it publicly. So I want to report that Paul Schumacher's surgery went well. We saw him on 
uh, the screen yesterday, and he's dealing with pain and, and, and recovery from his hip surgery, which was early this week. We have Elaine with us today at the piano, who's a couple weeks into her recovery, so it, it's wonderful to see you, uh, and our prayers continue for your continued recovery. Lorna's surgery, uh, our office manager, also went well. I, I had a conversation with her earlier this week, and she, I asked her how she's, uh, she's doing. She says, remarkably well. So keep her in your prayer. She has a lot of healing to, uh, to do uh, before she can be with us once again. And I received this prayer request uh, from Sheila Klansky. Uh, she asked that we put her nephew, Graham Bronson, on our prayer list. He was hit by a car this week. He has a broken clavicle and C7 vertebrae in his neck, so he's very lucky to be alive, and she has praise God and, uh, and, and good sturdy helmets, um, but he has a long and painful road to recovery, so please keep Graham in your prayers as well. And I would add one more prayer concern. You know, we, we, we asked you to do a lot, and we uh, constantly kept at you about this cat thing, and many of you were very faithful to that. We're so thankful for that. And now, we, as we're going to hear in a little bit from Jay, if you're able to stay, and we hope you do, about uh, the results for here locally, but also in general, I, I want you to pray about this church, our churches together. We learn many things. We have a lot of information, a lot of information that came out of that survey. You gave us so much. But here's the important thing that is so vital. What we learned in this information that really struck me is, is that we all together have much to do. And we've been called to do much. And, and you have told us this. It's not something, you know, you have spoken. And we have listened. And so I want you to pray for this community of faith as we seek to respond to those, those things we've said collectively together. Some of them I knew and made perfect sense to me. I, I recognize that. Others, a little surprising. But what we discovered was that you care. And that you're interested and that you want to see us go forward. You want to see us do something. Well, we've heard you, and we're going to seek how we can do that, but not just your leadership alone. We're going to try to work through the information, get better, but we're going to do it together, all of us. So we're going to need you desperately. So pray for this community of faith, for one another as we go forward, as we seek to honor the Lord and grow into the future. And I found this a tremendous amount of opposition Optimism, I can't even say what it is. Hope. How's that? Better. Uh, I discovered a great deal of hope in what I, I, I read in that. Uh, and uh, hope is what it's about. That's what it matters. We're not done yet, folks. This church is a great church. It has wonderful people. Its potential is unbelievable. We have been given gifts that put us in a position to do wonderful things. We have skilled people. We have faithful people. We have spiritual people in our midst who care. And that's you. You've told us that. I've known it, but it's wonderful to see it on paper, and so we can celebrate it and go forward together. So that is wonderful news. Pray for that. Pray for the success. Pray for the future. Pray for the guidance that God will give us. It's called breakthrough prayer, my friends. Breakthrough, that God will break through our doubts, our inabilities, our, our feelings of inadequacy to show us the way. That's what breakthrough prayer is about. It isn't meaning tell God what to do. It's praying to God that God will show us what to do. So I call upon that prayer, if you would, please. Let us have a moment of silent prayer and reflection, and then I will have a prayer, and then we can join our Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Merciful God, the scriptures tell us that new every day is your mercy for us. We're so grateful for that mercy. We so desperately need it. And from that mercy, we experience grace. Grace that we understand as being the love of the Father, the grace of the Son, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit that unites us, that unites us together in that beautiful truth that Jesus shared with the world that has been entrusted with those who followed him and have followed him to this very day. We've cluttered that truth up. We've confused it. We've covered it with so many layers that some people have trouble finding it again. Break through all of that, God. 
break through it all and bring us to faith in the faith of Jesus Christ as he taught it. What follows is wonderful and beautiful, and it allows us to understand things from other people's perspectives, and it is enlightening and wonderful in what they wrote and their perspectives. But if we do not approach what others have said from what your son said, we can be so easily led astray. So keep us faithful to that, that beautiful truth of Jesus Christ. Be with all of those we've mentioned today in those circumstances, those who are listed in our bulletin for prayer concerns, be with all of them in their lives. Many people are this day mourning. They're dealing with the death of loved ones such as a young man named Ian Shepherd, whose graveside service I did this past week, 28 years old, God, much too soon. Be with the Shepherd family. Be with all people in all places this day that mourn and give them the grace that you have given this world to know the way to truth and hope and life that is Jesus Christ. So be with all of those we think of at this time, those who are grieving, those who are facing surgery or recently uh, experienced surgery in their recovery, and, and any others that come to our minds and our hearts at this time. Be with them, God. We know that you love us. We know that you love them. Help us to make that connection, that connection of love that will keep us together in the true faith in the faith of Jesus Christ, just as your, his brother Jude called us to. Help us to stay ever faithful. We pray this in the name of our God and our Lord, who has taught us to pray, our Father. And now, as, as you know, if you've been here for a while, uh, the offering box sets back by the door going into the fellowship hall. If you brought an offering today, we invite you to drop it in that box. Uh, and that's how we collect the offering in our church. But I would like to pray a blessing on that. May we pray? Heavenly Father, we ask you bless the efforts of this church. We are a church committed to following Jesus Christ. We are a church committed to loving our neighbor. We struggle, like all do, to find that way. But if you show us, God, we will follow it. We seek to honor you. We do so in this hour where we, we worship together, but help us to do so as we go out of these doors. Help us to look anew at those we share this world with, not judging them because of how they appear, not judging them because of what political party they may be in or what position they take on this or that, but first judging them as being worthy of love and care. There's plenty of time for disagreement. There's plenty of time for division. That, that it will be a part of who we are, but there is no time to wait to find unity once again around that faith. So bless us, God. Bless these gifts and their use. May this church continue to stand as a testimony that people can love each other, people can accept each other, people can worship together in spirit and truth. And we pray that ever be so. In Jesus' most holy name, amen. Would you sing with me just the refrain of Alleluia, Alleluia. The words will be up here too. My dear friends, may God bless you. God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and work in your life.
Jesus said of God that he has begun a good work in you and in me, that he will see done to its completion. That work, that work that comes from our salvation is to grow in love and peace and unity. That is Jesus' gift to you and to me. May we receive it in joy. Amen. Closing hymn. It's all up here. 